Okay, we're back, everyone. Zach Naylor here, co-founder and CEO at Aurelius, and your host for the Aurelius podcast. We took about a month and a half off from the podcast. Part of that was that we needed a little bit of a break, but more importantly, we were super busy making some very exciting new features and enhancements for our user research tool, Aurelius. Also in that time, we made a few new videos of what's new and happening in Aurelius, so I'll make sure to have links to those in the show notes, but you can also check them out right on our homepage. Anyway, our next episode here is with Rob Walling. Rob is a maker, an entrepreneur. He's the co-founder at MicroConf, founder at Drip, which was acquired by Lead Pages, which happens to be here in Minneapolis, and most recently he's co-founder at TinySeed a new bootstrap founder accelerator and funding program. Rob has been building, scaling, and growing software products for a long time. As a founder, he's built or acquired and grown multiple successful products and companies, all self-funded or bootstrapped. He also runs a popular podcast, Startups for the Rest of Us, which has been going for quite some time and is packed with useful advice. Rob's background is impressive. But he might not seem like an immediate choice for a guest here on the Aurelius podcast, since we tend to focus heavily on UX, user research, and product management. Here's the thing. Rob has had to make dozens and dozens of tough design and product choices over the years in order to successfully build and grow software companies like he's done. He's actually the perfect choice for us to chat with to gain a fresh new perspective on just how we think about the balance between UX design and business. We had a great discussion with Rob about his background, how to make those big, hairy product decisions with confidence, and an ever-important topic of designing for customer onboarding to either a new product or feature. He shared with us his story of founding Drip, growing it to the product it became, and how he personally thought about and made some of those tough design decisions. I'm certain you'll have solid tips to take away from this episode. Our chat with Rob, as most often does, eventually led to using customer feedback, research, and insights from those conversations to make better informed design, product, and feature decisions. He and I talked about the challenge of organizing and acting on all that customer research and feedback that you have. With that, I want to remind you that we built Aurelius to help you solve that exact problem. Aurelius is a user research and insights platform to help you organize, search, and share all that customer research and feedback in one place. We've had a lot of very cool new features launch re- recently, and we've extended our free trial to 30 days. If you're interested, head over to our website and check it out for yourself. www.aureliuslab.com. That's aureliuslab.com. So with that, let's get going with our guest, Rob Walling. <laughs> Welcome to Aurelius Podcast, episode 35 with Rob Walling. He's the co-founder at MicroConf, a conference for self-funded startups and SaaS apps. He's also the founder of Drip, an email marketing automation tool. And finally, most recently, he's also co-founder at TinySeed. Rob, welcome to the show. It's my pleasure. Thanks for, for inviting me on. Yeah, we're excited to chat with you. And so for those folks who are following along with our show, Rob's one of those uh, what might seem as like outlier guests that we have here. So even by by way of introduction, uh, some people who who aren't following you or don't know who you are might go, well, okay, how where's this conversation going to go? The thing is, uh, Rob has put out a lot of really great content on helping people understand their customers in order to design for their needs to successfully adopt and activate in their products. Uh, not to mention, he has successfully turned around a number of companies and started their own. Um, he's got a lot to share, I think, with regard to UX design and product. Uh, so we're excited to get into that with you. That sounds good. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it's a good episode. I'm excited to uh, talk about you know new, new and exciting things, uh, not answer the same questions I often do on interviews. Right on. Well, you know, so just uh, to get some of those things out of the way for for the folks listening uh, who may not be familiar with you and your work, Rob, maybe tell us a little bit about the things that you're working on and, and sort of what's passionate uh, for you these days. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think in a nutshell, you know, I'm a I'm a founder, I'm an entrepreneur, and I've started and even at times acquired. Um, several SaaS apps and software products over the years. And so that's always been the part that's really excited me about 
that's how, kind of how I channel my creativity. Um, so most recently, you know, I started Drip, as you mentioned, and then uh, we were acquired in uh, 2016 by a company local to us here in town, Lead Pages. Um, and then I've for years been been talking about this this idea of being a founder and and not only doing that, but bootstrapping it and maintaining control of your company. And I'm not anti-funding for sure, um, but I like the idea of folks, you know, building companies instead of building slide decks and actually, you know, having the rubber meet the road. So I I've talked about that on a, uh, my blog which has 400 essays, you know, about this kind of stuff. I have a podcast with 400 episodes, 420 episodes that where it's just me talking about, here's how I've done it. Here's advice here, you know, or insights, here's your mistakes I've made. Um, and then of course, you know, the conference and I've written a book and all that stuff. So I, I enjoy, I almost enjoy talking about starting startups more than I enjoy actually starting and running them. But to be honest, the starting and running them is, has been far more lucrative for me than the, you know, than, than running a conference and writing a book. Yeah, I can imagine if that's true. Well, it's funny how that works. The, the stuff that's way, way harder all of a sudden turns, turns to be, uh, uh, turns out to be a little bit more lucrative. Well, uh, well, you've done both successfully. And for, for what it's worth, as Rob and I were chatting before we started recording here, I've been, I've been following and reading your content uh, for quite some time now, and interestingly enough, had been turned on to that by a prior guest of ours uh, at Price Intelligently, uh, Patrick Campbell. And so uh, it's really interesting. I think you both do a pretty good job at sharing that stuff. And so we had him on the show. He, again, he was one of those, what would seem like an outlier guest, but had a lot to share with regard to, well, here's how to do research to inform this thing and lessons that we can take away uh, on how to improve pricing, but more importantly, why that's relevant to just the work we do and even building companies and products, right? Right, that makes sense. Well, he's a super sharp guy and he's, you he know, I've known each other for several years. He's spoken at my conference. I actually, sp yeah, I spoke at his conference too. I've forgotten about that. So um, you have a lot of respect for Patrick. Yeah, right on. Okay, so has anybody ever asked you why, right? You talk about the uh, your passion and love for sort of making and starting and building uh, companies, businesses, products. Why is that the case? Yeah, for me, I think it's always been about creativity and wanting to be a maker and being in control of what I'm able to make. And, you know, I remember being a, a kid growing up and we lived out in the country, didn't really have much TV, and I would spend hours and hours making things, whether it was something physical or I would write computer code from the time I was eight years old. And spending six or seven hours in front of the computer and building a game was life-giving and life-changing to me. And as I got older, I still enjoyed that and I enjoyed the, enjoy the kind of the ethos of, of creativity. When I got out of college, I'm writing code for big, you know, bigger companies. I was a consultant. They did all kinds of stuff. And it was, it was fun for a couple of years. And I had a lot of create, creative freedom and just in terms of like maybe not in terms of what I was building, but in terms of, hey, I, I'm able to pound away at a keyboard and build something that's cool, even if it was an invoicing system or a, you know, a shopping cart or a whatever. And that was fun for about two or three years. And then I realized, I don't feel creative anymore. And what do I need to do to find, to be able to be in control of what I build at that point? And that's where, for me, it was like, what are, what are the possibilities? What are the possible avenues that can get me to where I have more creative freedom. And for me, creativity is not, I'm not an artist, you know, I, I don't, um, I, I don't paint photos, I don't sculpt things, but just the ability to even create companies or build products, you know, like I built with Drip or, or to shape a new funding model like I'm doing with my, my current startup, Tiny Seed, um, that is, is crazy life-giving to me. And so I actually have a tattoo on my wrist that says create, and it's all, it's in, it's in like a typewriter font, career. And that is my daily reminder that if I go long enough without building new things, then I atrophy and I become, you know, not happy. And so that's really what it is, is I enjoy building companies because they've brought me freedom. And that was my hope originally. Uh, but I also do enjoy the process of in building a company, there is creativity in doing that, especially a software company, because, uh, you know, as, as you and your listeners know, like building software, there's a ton of uh, as many as many spreadsheets and and surveys as we can do, there's still a ton of creativity in that process. I couldn't agree more. And in fact, one of the, you know, I guess we had uh, Denise Jacobs. She actually does a lot of research about creativity and burnout. Uh, and she wrote a book, Banish Your Inner Critic. 
But one of the things that she she said on our show uh, is that creativity has like less to do with art than many many people think. I, I actually I actually think that that's a misconception. Um, and she sort of affirmed that for us when she said, uh, I think it was something to the effect of like creativity is just like the, the you know, the, the act of making, bringing something that did not exist into the world. And so, so by that definition, right, I mean, you fall very, very hardly in the center <laughs> of uh, creativity. And I would agree. I think that's why it's certainly one of the reasons why I've gotten into doing what we do and, and why I derive joy from it. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think, see, I get the same you know, I don't know if it's endorphin rush or or whatever it is, but I get the same rush from putting a, a really um, well thought out, well written blog post that I spent a ton of time writing, you know, an essay into the world, or uh, putting a podcast episode live, or pushing a new feature in a software product, mm-hmm. or even you know, I play the guitar and I've been in a few bands. I'm not anymore, but like even writing a, like a, a song that I was really proud of, like all of those things in different ways, those give me life. And a lot of other things like dealing with the legal side of and the financial <laughs> side of starting a company. So there are parts of the company I don't love, but I put up with them in order to do the ones that do, you know, kind of bring me energy. Right. Yeah. No, that's great. Uh, so here's the thing I want to ask you, because you've done this more than once successfully. Is there a way you look at, right, almost like a framework or just a, a set of principles that you look at when you're doing that kind of work of building a new product or building a new company? Yeah. I mean, there is, there's, there's kind of two, you know, product versus company is actually two different things. So let's, let's talk about product real quick. Mm -hmm. When I'm in the early days of trying to think of, of either a novel software product or a novel take on an existing software product. Cause if you think about drip, it, it started as almost a bolt on, to other ESPs, it was very minimalist product, and and it, it it you know worked with Mailchimp and Aweber, which are two of the big ESPs. Then it became itself an ESP, email service provider. Then it kind of went another layer and became marketing automation. And in the very early days of that, there were two things that I was always holding in tension. One is our customers and trials and prospects are asking for things, so it was the incoming inputs. And there was a vision in my head of what I wanted it to be. And I always had to ask myself, which of these should win right now for the time being? And so, um, you know, I think that, that the, the visionary, the product visionary that we, we think of and we hear about in the media Mm -hmm. that makes all these gut decisions. I think that's a misnomer and a mistake. And I think, to be honest, I think always listening to your customer is a mistake. Like there has to be this mix of this, this gut feeling or this vision that, you know, when you get this input from customers, especially in the early days, we were getting, you know, 10 pieces of feedback a day. We couldn't build them all. The, the, the product would have been a shit show, you know, and, and we had to make a decision. No, our vision is to do this. It's a very simple product and it does X, Y, Z. And it, we will never build landing pages into Drip. We will never build a shopping cart into Drip. These are all things people asked us to build because some of our distant competitors did that. Yeah. Well, see, I think that that's... Uh... That's brilliant. And, and before I even get into my response to that, Rob, I just I think it's a very um, important nuance that you caught out there. Although in reality, it's not a nuance that there's a difference between starting a company and starting a product. Because yeah. and the reason I want to just kind of like latch onto that for a minute is I think that there's a lot of people who are pretty good at being able to start products. But that doesn't directly translate into starting a new business. And so, uh, you know, Success does like in one does not necessarily breed success in the other. I guess is what I'm, is, is is the point I'd make in that. Um, but you know, more more specific to especially the story you just told with Drip is I think that's very important in particularly those listening who are in design and research and product. Oftentimes, it's our job to help craft that vision, right, of what the product mm-hmm. should be, but almost more importantly, what the product should not be, so there that we're go. not caught here chasing our tail in product development simply reacting to customer requests because that's that's a bad deal, right? And, and those of us who are seasoned researchers are going to tell you the first thing that, that uh, about research is you don't ask people what they want. You find out what they need and you find out what their behavior is. Yep. Yeah, no, that's, and that's a good point. I, you know, in the, so Drip was, was independent in, in essence, it was bootstrapped for three years, I believe, three and a half years, then we were acquired. And then we worked inside a larger company. And when we were independent, 
uh, my and my co-founder had to say no a lot. We kind of co-ran product. He was the the engineer writing the code, and I was kind of doing everything else. And we together we sh- we helped shape that product. We had to say no to customers, right? That was the big no. Uh, uh, a person we had to say no to at that point. Once we were acquired, we still had to say no sometimes to customers, but it was definitely a more mature product. At that point, we had to learn to say no to internal teams. Right, it was the sales team that would ask for things, or the, and again, it's not that we were we didn't say no all the time, but you have to say no. You know, we were getting 150 feature requests a month. Uh, you know, as of maybe eight months ago, I left Drip about seven or eight months ago, and when I was leaving, 150 requests a month. You you can't build more than maybe 10 features a month. You know, right. these are substantial things, and so you are you do say no 80 90 percent of the time, or at least I had to, and it was. But in order to do that, though, you have to a feel okay with that, and b, you really need to believe in your vision to to stand up to that kind of pressure. You know what I mean? Like, because if you if you if you doubt, you know your your research, whether it's it's your data inputs or if you doubt your own gut feel and intuition, and I believe both those two things need to be there. And intuition, I mean, kind of vision, product vision. Like if you doubt either of those, it can be really hard and you can say yes to too many things. So I love the, the concept you brought up of deciding what we are and what we will not be. And at, once you have those two down, you can go for a certain amount of time and have confidence like, I know that we're not going to do this and that's okay. You know, and you can change your mind at some point, right? It's not like you're a politician. You can never change your mind or else everyone lambasts you. You can get to the point, you know, if, if in six months you realize, you know what, we should build that. And I, so I did that actually with automation. Um, we were in ESP, we sent email, broadcast emails and campaigns, and customers were saying, you know what, there's this whole thing called marketing automation, it's more advanced than what you're doing, but it's really a catastrophe, like all the companies doing it are really expensive, that UX and usability is terrible, et cetera, et cetera. Could you just build some automation features? And we kept saying, no, 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 we're not automation, we're not automation, we're not autom-. And eventually we realized, oh, there's a huge market opportunity here. And that was the luxury we had as both product people and founders is we could we just made a decision one day to say, you know what, we're going to go after this. And we basically, it wasn't even a pivot because it was really a, just an extension of, of functionality, but we really did decide to go whole hog into, uh, into automation based on that. Right. Right. Well, and we know how that story ends, right? Obviously the, obviously the right thing to do, I, by I can very comfortably from the outside say yeah. it seems that way right thing to do it drip and um you know and I think that's fair a pivot would have been uh an uprooting and changing or a, a dramatic refocusing right and it doesn't right. sound like that at all but my question for you well I actually have two uh, particularly based on what you just said Rob is so so there's there's a lot of people out here listening to the show building products who go, yeah, that's fine. We should have a vision and we should be comfortable saying no. But but this isn't happening widely, right? So my question to you is, what's missing? You know, why aren't people doing this uh, more often? Why aren't they able to, to, to find that kind of success in product development that, that you've just described? That's, oh, that's an interesting question. You know, what, you know what it reminds me of is when you go into certain products, you will find that they are opinionated. And that word, being opinionated, can be viewed as a good or a bad thing. Okay. Okay, when I log into Salesforce, it's not opinionated because there are 9,000 fields that you can do anything you want with. As a result, I hate using that app. It's such a catastrophe. The UX <laughs> is terrible. But then you log into something like Pipedrive or Close.io, which are also CRMs, but they're more start, you know, they're startups. They're pretty opinionated about how you use them. As a result, they're way easier to use. They're more fun to use if your style fits, you know, their their style of CRM. Salesforce sure. can be anything. Pipedrive is, a, in my opinion, a much better product, but they're also, of course, you know, smaller. Basecamp's opinionated software, right? They yep. don't. They they say you kind of do it this way, or you don't use us, you know. And and that's. I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, my co-founder of Drip is now on to his next thing, and it's called it's called Level. So it's at Level App, and it's basically a Slack competitor, but it's a very opinionated Slack competitor. And that he says, this is a non-interruptive chat mm. tool, non-interruptive. It's not going to interrupt you because he he found that when we came to a big company, lead pages, all of us, a product and engineering, you know, we're makers. We need 
hours to do stuff, we would just get pinged constantly on Slack. So every 10 minutes, you're getting this ping. And I was like, this cannot continue. Like I would tell my guys to snooze their their, uh, uh, Slack notifications for hours on end and all that stuff. And so that's not what he's working on. He's very opinionated about how it's going to work. And if someone says, no, 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 I want to be able to, he's already had questions. Hey, can I at channel everyone and have it, you know, go to mm-hmm. everyone and the whatever. And he's like, nope. And it will probably never do that. And so back to your question, it's like, why don't people do that? I think they're scared to commit or they're scared of the fallback or they don't want to say no, or they don't want to disappoint or they feel the pressure from a boss or the sales manager or a customer that they're going to lose. You know, there, there's all these negative things that can come from being opinionated. Yep. But my hypothesis would be, but there are even better things that come from being opinionated if you're willing to stand your ground. That's no. So you literally answered 75% of the very next question I was going to ask you, Rob, uh, which is, you know, like, how do, how do you get around that? Or why is that the case? And I couldn't agree more that fear drives a lot of decisions in people's lives. We're getting pretty philosophical on this episode pretty quickly. Uh, and I love it. But uh, it, it, it drives a lot of people's decisions and even in our professional lives, right? So personally, yes. And, uh, you know, this is not the show for that. Although, uh, if you get Joseph and I sometime, we can rap about that as much as you like, but professionally speaking, that absolutely happens. Now, the reason why I say, I think you address 75% of that, because the question I still have is then, uh, you know, h- how do we get, how do we get people to make decisions in spite of that fear or to remove that fear? Because at least here's my statement and actually a quote that I'll share, right? Uh, if you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. And that's kind of what's happening here in product, right? And that to me is like, and yes, some of those enterprise type companies. Um, so you gave the sales for Salesforce example. Um, it's because it's generic. It's trying to please everyone, which means you really probably please no one. So how do we get our teams to agree to please, you know, the right things or the right vision? Yeah, I think it's, I do think it's hard at larger companies where the culture is not product focused. Okay. There are companies that are built around the product and the product comes first. And again, Basecamp is one of those and Pipedrive is one of those and and Drip was one of those. The product came first. And so the engineers and the designers and our, you know, we were all I base the whole company around make the product successful and the company will be successful. Now, I knew we had to market it. You know, I'm not the developer who goes into his basement and builds, writes a bunch of code and thinks that's going to fix the world. But I did let the product kind of lead that. If you are at a company that just isn't, you know, I, I can imagine working for Salesforce or let's say I worked at Microsoft and I'm head of, of Microsoft Word. You know, it's like there are certain products where I just, I don't know if that's possible. I I don't know if the momentum is too far in that direction. And then there are probably companies that are in between those two extremes, you know, of what I mentioned, right? Where, because it's a continuum for sure, where if you come in and you show that, that, show that you have a strong vision and you convince whatever stakeholders you need that you do have this vision and that you're going to, that you're going to do things a little differently perhaps, you know, than most people, and you're going to say no more often, but that you will get results and you will build a great product and that will lead to these great results in the market. I, I, I think that's, that's kind of what you have to do. If you can't convince your boss or whatever, you know, whoever it is that, that you have to convince, then why would they let you say no? You know, if, if the sales manager asks you for something with a VP of sales and you say no, and then the VP of sales goes to the CEO and says, well, this person just keeps saying no to all my requests, you have to be able to justify that, right? And so it depends on how much credibility or leeway you have. If the CEO says, you know what? I trust I trust that Rob's doing the best for the product. He's already shown results and that's the way he does things. And so he has the final say. Or does your CEO override you and say, nope, VP of sales said this, now we have to build it. Well, at that point, me personally, I'm gone. Like I'm, I'm. There's no fucking chance I'm going to stick around and deal with that. But not everyone has that luxury to to put up with that. So that's a that's a long answer, but you, you get the idea. You know, there's this this. Uh, I, I think there are certain companies that are certainly more friendly to it, and and others that aren't. Yeah, no, that's great. And a couple of things that I'm pulling out from that answer too. <clears throat> a couple of things that I'm pulling out from that answer. You know, you talk about having a vision, having an opinion. So first of all, those are two very subjective things I want to dig into. But then uh, the ability to show results based on that, right? These are things that I actually gave a talk at uh, World Usability Day in Cleveland this year. 
And I've, do, I've done this talk a couple different places, but it's how to sell your ideas, quote unquote, to anyone, right? And it's totally a clickbait title, but the principle of it is that exactly what you said, that why should anybody understand or listen to or take your ideas if you don't know what's good for them to get them results? So it's fine to have your opinion, but the reality of it is the best ideas, this is this is my, my very strong stance on this, are not actually just ideas and opinion. They're based on something, right? You don't just wake up one day and say, here's the thing we're going to do. That formed, that thought even formed because of some exposure you had, hopefully to customers, some understanding you have, hopefully of your business and how to get results. And a great idea, right? A great product, feature, design comes where you've got a really strong balance between those two things. I would agree with that. And, you know, earlier when I said, I, I used the phrase kind of gut feel or instinct, and then I said vision, those, those are actually, I misspoke there because gut feel and instinct comes from exposure to customer needs, customer pains, and kind of the right and wrong way to do thing. And so it became, I said gut feeling because after two or three years of being the founder of this tiny startup where I interfaced with almost every customer we had on yeah. a recurring basis, it became second nature to me to make these decisions. And other people would say, Rob has this great instinct about what to build in drip. <laughs> but that wasn't what it was. It was, as you just said, it was this ongoing, never ending, constant interaction with hundreds of our customers. And it was both, it was via email, it was via Zoom. I would see them at conferences. I would, you know, would interview them on podcast. I mean, whatever. I knew what they were up to. I knew I was one of them, even if they weren't running a SaaS app, which we did have a lot of customers who basically did the same thing I did. But we had folks running e-commerce websites and info products. And I had, I had done all of those at one time or another. So I like that you brought it back to, it's not, it isn't this, this, product visionary who just has opinions because he want, he or she wants to have opinions, those opinions do need to form out of something. But at a certain point, they do feel like this secondhand intuition almost, mm -hmm. but that's not quite the right word. It's intuition built out of uh, an, an expertise and an exposure to a certain you know subset of people. Yes, absolutely. Beautifully said. And, and this is, this is, uh, you know, this is the same drum that we beat here at Aurelius because we talk a lot about user research, duh, we're a, a, a research insights repository, right? Like that's what our product is. Um, but the reason that's so important to us is exactly that exposure, right? Because, because you're right. It's this, it's this misnomer. It's, it's a thing that's totally bullshit, by the way, there's nobody who just knows how to build good stuff. Uh, what happens is inevitably you get a bunch of exposure that gives you some foresight and deep understanding to make decisions without data always directly informing it. But that doesn't mean it's not informing those choices you make, right? It's just that that intuition, well, that's, as you said, that's where that came from. Uh, enough exposure builds that intuition. And so, I mean, again, why that's so important to the, the product we're building with Aurelius is that we're trying to help build institutional intuition, right? Because the way it works today is that, you know, we go out and we do research and then we put it in a PowerPoint deck and we send it to somebody and they never open it again. They listen to us during the meeting of what we heard from customers, but that actually really needs to live on more often, more, more accessible, more frequently so that people, and, and I love that you said gut instinct because that gut instinct formed and it formed from exposure and learning, you know, over time. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the hard part about you know, if you bring in a new product person it, or even a UX person, like trying to in, impart several years of that data that's kind of been pulled into your own personal DNA, trying to get that into their heads uh, quickly, even really talented, smart people who want to learn it. It's like, it, you can't, you can't just write a document and hand it to them. You know, it, it really has, I mean, we were doing shadowing to be honest, like, cause uh, you know, after the acquisition, we wanted more people to be able to make decisions about parts of the product. So we didn't have to make a decision about every checkbox um, and where it went and how it went. And it, we really just had them shadow us and talked through here. Here's the 150 feature request. Here's how we think about each one. You know, this one isn't going to work and here's why. And we always had a reason. It wasn't because I said so. Right. You know, it was always like, well, because I know no one's going to use this. Well, how do you know that? Oh, because we, you know, there was because we asked them or because they're SaaS apps and they don't need that feature. Or, I mean, we just, but we just knew it off the top of our heads. There was no reference to it. And so that was, uh, that's what we found is kind of the best way to try to get people up to speed as well as exposure to customers for sure. 
Yeah, definitely. And and I don't think it's I don't think it's reasonable to expect that everybody in a company, a particularly a larger one or a growing one, gets access to customers all the time. Hence why having some sort of repository or central place where all that's stored and it's able to just be self-serviced. Well, then all of a sudden everybody has access to that finding and that knowledge, you know, faster and easier than you ever had before. And yeah, then you don't have to rely on this thing, which, you know, maybe some of you out there listening have been in this situation where I work at company X and they hired somebody from company Y who's in a similar space that they admire and they expect that person to come in riding in on a white horse and solve all of our product and, uh, and customer need problems because they were successful elsewhere. And even if it's the same industry, like that just isn't the case. Yeah, that's that's actually a really interesting concept because I haven't heard of you know a product that does that aside from from yours. Um, and the way the way that I've one way I've seen it handles is is like pumping things into Slack. I remember like cancellation reasons were pumped in there, and and it was cool. It was a stream of info, which was nice, uh, but it was not searchable, nor was it organized, nor was it you know exactly. it wasn't actually that. It wasn't a really a repository. It was more of just a, a live stream. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's fungible in that case, right? It like it expired. Whereas yeah. yes, uh, what we're trying to do is like, well, the shelf life of this is a lot longer and you can even make new meaning from it if you've got it to your point organized and sort of tagged in the right way. And yep, that's, uh, that's our bag, baby. But uh, <laughs> we're not here to talk a whole lot about that. I, I kind of want to move on a little bit more than, you know, so so you've done this and helps other people try to figure out how to build that right intuition and build the right products and stuff, right? It, it seems that you've zoomed out a little bit now at this point, particularly with Tiny Seed, right? So so tell us a little bit more about that and sort of how how you came to decide that that was going to be your next pursuit. Yeah, yeah, sure. So Tiny Seed is, um, you know, starting off, we're, we're the first startup accelerator designed for people who would traditionally bootstrap or self-fund a company. Right now, there are accelerators like Y Combinator and 500 Startups, and they follow the venture capital model, where if you want to be a billion-dollar company someday, then you can come do this, and you're going to try to get a Series A, uh, raise funding, and, and go big or basically go bust. But in my world, in my community that I've built you know, with the conference and the podcasts and the book and all that... Uh, to me, building a company that does one million, ten million, twenty million a year, little a little you know little quote unquote SaaS company. Mm -hmm. If you bootstrap that, or if you take a small amount of funding and only sell ten, twenty percent of it, that is incredibly lucrative. Like it can be life changing for both the founders, investors. Like there is no one, almost no one, putting any money behind that. So if you today want to start a SaaS company and build it to just you know again ten million, which can be life changing there you kind of just have to self fund it or bootstrap it so it's a really it, it's a hard road for folks and it's getting harder and harder because more funding is coming into the you know the saas space in general and so that's the reason we started it um i have you know again i started off writing code for other people then i moved up to building products for other people then i moved to building software products for myself and then, you know, drip in the acquisition. And now I, it, it really is a zoom out, you know, to then say, well, I know quite a bit about what makes something work, a SaaS app, particularly what makes it work, both on a product level, but a company level and a marketing level. And I also uh, have, you know, connection with a lot of founders who I think could use, they could use the, the bump, you know, who could use the help. I see folks working a day job, launching something on the side, and it's a, it's a ton of work. Nights and weekends are hard, especially if you have a family. And if we can just provide one year's worth of runway to someone and say, here, take a year and work on this thing. I mean, we've seen, you know, we have, I've seen in like um, my own experience with founders, I've seen that make a huge difference, right? It's that difference of focus to be able to go from 10 hours a week, 15 hours a week, and it's your nights and weekends. So it's like your worst you know, 15 hours a week to being able to focus full time on something. It can have a real uh, uh, ground making difference. Yeah, man, that's huge. And, uh, and I'm glad that you shared that story too, because it's one that uh, I will speak for Joseph. We can, we can very much relate to. I don't know a lot of people uh, listening to the show know that much about our company, but we actually are hundred percent bootstrapped in that regard. And yeah, we can relate. It's, um, 
it's hard work and it's something that we were passionate about i think for the very same reasons you are rob which is just this like this purity of intention and decision making you know yeah. where where you get to stand for something you get to make decisions uh and you get to say no proudly not arrogantly but like proudly and say no we're very specific on the certain kind of problem we want to solve and 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 how we believe people need it solved yep that's right and i think that that's been the that's the been the problem with trying to start a, a startup is you can either be totally bootstrapped, which is a pretty hard, long road. I've done it. That's all I've done, actually. So I've never raised funding. And every time it was really hard. Or you could raise venture funding, which is an all or nothing game. And you don't have all these, you know, could potentially lose control of your company. Yeah. Um, you you tend to have to live in a, in a startup hub. There's all this baggage that comes along with that. You have a board and all that. And there hasn't been an in-between. And that's what we are, like, I want to single-handedly change that. You know, there, there's maybe one fund out there right now that I know of that is in between those two and does not expect you. They'll, they'll put some funding in and then they don't expect you to raise a Series A. And we want to be an accelerator for that, which is earlier stage, and provide as much support as we can. And this is, you know, your listeners probably don't know, but this is my wheelhouse anyways. I mean, this is what my conference and my book and my podcast and uh, my essays, I mean, they're all aimed at that audience anyways. Real, you know, bootstrappers are people who kind of want to... to build either lifestyle business or a little more than that. You know, I mean, I would say a, a business that's uh, making 10 million a year with a 40, 50% net profit margin, that's more than a lifestyle business at that point. Yeah, I mean, that you yeah. can, you can make some real change in a lot of lives with that. Definitely. No, that's, uh, that's great. And uh, something I know that I can say, I personally admire and uh, we're, we're very well on board for and, and wish you nothing but the best of luck with that. And also as part of that too, Rob, like, one of the things I want to ask is, while the folks listening here all may not be acquainted with the work you do and why, it, there's there's very applicable principles, right, that you understand about building a company, things you should understand of what's important in building a company, not just a product, that I think designers and researchers should take away, it, regardless of what size company they work at. Yeah. I mean, what, what do you have in mind in that, with that, like in terms of, yeah. So the one thing you actually mentioned in a story you told earlier is that, well, so this was regarding drip. We're not doing automation. We're not doing automation. We're not doing automation. And then we're doing automation. And so the thing there, right, this wasn't, this wasn't <laughs> Rob woke up on the wrong side of the bed or whatever and decided we're doing automation. As you told it, it was a market opportunity. And that's not something that I think many design or any designers and researchers at a lot of companies have A, any visibility into and B, uh, you know, any any capacity to sort of really understand because it's something that we're not necessarily trained in, right? But that's actually really fundamental to then the decisions that those people will end up making. And I can tell you firsthand, and this has to resonate with a lot of folks listening that, and I've been a part of early stage startups uh, as just a, a contributor, right? As a designer, front end person, whatever. And that happens and I'm like, what the hell are these people thinking? There was this thing that was completely off the radar and all of a sudden, it seems like somebody woke up and that's the choice we're making. And now we got to go and figure out how to make that awesome. But that's not actually how that happens, right? At least not mm -hmm. most of the time. Yeah, that's right. That's a, that's a really good point you picked up on there. Yeah. The, so the luxury I had, I'll put it this way. The luxury I had when we made that decision is we were only five people maybe, and I was the co-founder and CEO. So I could make whatever decision I wanted to. Now I didn't make a flippant impulsive decision. I've seen people do that and wreck their company, but I, I, I didn't do that. Had I made that kind of decision to dive into that, you know, when we were, if, when we were a hundred person team, I would have had to convince a lot of people and really show you can't just make that on a whim, you know, but when we made that decision, what's interesting is I'm not educated in market analysis either right i don't i don't have an mba i don't have a, i don't think i took a single business class in college i've read a lot of business books if that qualifies me to, to do that but all i did when this was happening was um number one i listened to our customers because mm -hmm. they kept saying there's this thing called you know aw pro tools that kind of helps aweber do some automation but it's okay and could you just build that into drip and then I, they said, hey, Infusionsoft is this really great tool, but it's really hard to use because you build some of their features into Drip. And you know, it was that kind of stuff. And I kept hearing it from folks, frankly, who I trusted. There were customers who I knew were pretty smart and were kind of at the, at the head of their game. And that also helped, right? If you're talking to 500 customers, they're n I didn't weight them all equally. I mean, I weighted the ones who 
I knew were knowledgeable, who were really killing it with their campaigns, who were also influencers. So I knew, I just knew that they knew what they were doing Mm -hmm. and they had recommendations. So that was one input. And I was very resistant to that for a while. But then the other one was I went online and started Googling, like, what are uh, marketing automation? What is that? What are these tools? And I mean, they're just articles. They were literally just articles online from like Business Insider and other places that are like, this marketing automation thing is, is growing at 30% a year. And it's supposed to do that over the next five or 10 years. Like it was huge. It's going to double, you know, in three years. And I was like, that's fascinating. I've never even heard of it. So then drill down, what is marketing automation? Who, you know, who are these people? And I, I was literally just in Google. I had no, again, no training and no special stuff. And I gathered all this data in a, in a big spreadsheet. And then I went to my co-founder and I was like, look, I think this is, I think this is big. And there's no one priced in this market less than $300 a month for this tool. Mm -hmm. And I think we could build about 70 or 80% of the functionality in four or five months. And I think we could charge 99 bucks for it. You know, that was kind of my pitch. Mm -hmm. And then, and then we had to evaluate is that is Rob just nuts, you know? And, (laughs) and it was like, well, let's whiteboard this. And so then he and I sat down for two hours. We whiteboarded exactly how we'd build this first run of it. Of You know, we were, well, something we were pretty good at was building like quick 1.0s. And I know three or four months is not a quick 1.0, but we actually dribbled out little pieces of it during that time that went all the way to production. About every two weeks, we were shipping stuff. But we built a pretty dang automation, pretty dang cool automation engine in just a few months. And um, we ran it by, of course, we took pictures of the whiteboard. We ran it by a few of those customers who said they were interested and they were like, you know, in in an old cartoon where your eyes boggle out of the head (laughs) and it it makes the honking sound. And so we knew we were onto something and we did take a gamble, you know, and I did, I wouldn't say we bet the company on it because I don't think we would have tanked, mm-hmm. but it would have been a pretty big hit, been a pretty deep hit to us if, if that automation had not caught on because it was an absolute pivotal point in the company where we went from somewhat, st- we weren't stagnant, but we were growing slowly to like, f- I mean, I, th- I think it 5 x our month over month growth Holy in that last, moly. that lasted forever. It was insane. Yeah. So a small bump is, is what small you're bump. saying. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. <laughs> so, excellent. Well, I I love that story, and you know, uh, as part of my job is sort of as is in hosting our show here is is bringing it back to what I think designers and researchers uh, ought to take away from this is really like again we come back to this conversation of context, and so understanding the context your work takes place in. So you had a lot of confidence designers and researchers are there to also provide confidence and it is just a piece of the puzzle that is a whole confidence of making a big decision like that right and so sometimes because i think that we can get uh this feeling like we're hamsters on a wheel we're doing research and we're sharing with people and they're not making uh what we would consider smarter informed choices based off that yada yada but that's only because the context there matters right if if one of the things that we hear from customer research is that we should do X, but the market opportunity says Y. Well, those things are misaligned and it's not because we did bad research. It's not because people don't want to listen to us. I would argue that it's that we need to understand the people we work with and for just as well, understand the needs of the business as well as the needs of customers. And then we can help people make really awesome decisions. Yeah. And that's a, that's a balance. Um, it's, it's I won't say, it's a little easier than it sounds, right? It's it's hard work to try to hold two things. I mean, there's a someone said there's the definition of wisdom is being able to hold two ideas in your head that are perhaps contrary to one another or that pull in opposite directions, but knowing that neither one is incorrect, you know, and that's that's what I think this is, is it's um, trying to balance this. And also if you if you have customers and they're telling you things and you see a market opportunity over here in a different direction. Well, you may not be able to ask those customers what they think about it because it may be enough of a pivot that they don't want to do it. And you may have to make the decision, well, I'm going to bring them along with us, you know, and that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother conversation that's probably outside of the scope of where we're going now. Totally. But, but I'm glad that you brought it up because again, it's just one of those things of like, as a, as a UX person, as a product person, as a research person, understanding that, that those opportunities present themselves and oftentimes might might feel like they fly in the face of all the work we've been doing, you know, uh, companies and other leaders aren't always that great at articulating those things, but they do exist. And so if, and when that's happening, I think it's, I think it's the onus is on us, right. To say, okay, well, help me understand what's changed. Cause a lot of times, as you've just illustrated, uh, there's good rationale for it. No, 
don't get me wrong, <laughs> there's plenty of cases where there wasn't, but by us being good stewards, right, of that kind of work and those decisions and asking the question, maybe we we, we kill the crazy <laughs> before we, we make a, a choice that does tank your company uh, because it didn't actually have the proper rationale. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Right on, man. Uh, so the other thing I want to ask, you've got to this point, you've made a good product decision of some kind. One of the things that you've shared quite a bit on is this idea of like onboarding and activating customers. And I think that that's applicable to products as a whole and also just new features, new, uh, changes to features, right? Yeah, big time. If you're not, um, you know, as you launch new features, especially as as an app gets more and more complicated, right? As you add, as you stack those features on one another, it becomes very hard for people to find them. I think there, I think there is a different approach between the two. Like, you know, when you're in the early days, when your product is simpler, activating trial users so that they will get value out of your product tends to be what I, it's just a customer development problem, right? It, it involves talking to customers, finding out what they're trying to get out of it, and then figuring out what two or three steps they need to take to get that. And it's just that first initial bump. You're trying to get them to the minimum path to awesome is what I call it, the MPA. And it's like, what they could probably do 10 things and get there, but can you just figure out a way for them to do it in two or three? And so, you know, in the early days with Drip, it was like, you need to do install a little JavaScript snippet. You needed to write some email copy and you needed to, um, I don't even remember what the third one was. Oh, it was put a, a conversion, like a tr conversion value or something at, so that you knew how much each email address was worth to you. And we started off very simply with a, a thing that I created in an hour to just send emails to people and be like, hey, you've signed in and this is really your first milestone. You know, all you have to do is install this JavaScript. Here you go. And then we'd remind them. And then we started doing it in app once I had the development resources to do it. And, um, you know, that that became kind of a nice thing. I mean, just to flow across the top wizard of, you know, how, they, how far they were into the process. Um, and then you know, once we got further down the line, the, the the nice part in the early days when you're simple, it's pretty easy to do. When you get down the line and you have hundreds of features, that's where it becomes, how are we going to, not only how are we going to allow people to find this, but how are we going to convince them that it's valuable enough that they should pay attention to it? You yeah. know, and we we went through a bunch of different, bunch of different approaches, whether it's a little, you know, a, a pop down every time they log in, hey, these are the new features, whether it's uh, an email that goes out every two or four weeks with all the new features in it, um, whether it's a little, I mean, there's, there's other ways to do it, but um, I, I certainly think that surfacing new features later in the app is, is uh, an, I, I won't say unsolved problem, but it's definitely one of the harder problems in, in design and usability. Yeah, for sure. Well, that's the reason I bring it up because it's, it's another thing that again, I've, uh, I've watched, listened, and read a lot. You've had to share about that. And it's been actually very, very helpful for me personally and even for our own product. And again, given my background, the 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 wisdom, uh, as, as I would say, I'd impart on folks listening here who are in research and UX is, is be thinking about this stuff, right? So earlier on in the conversation, we were talking about being able to show results, have an impact. Uh, I can speak from experience and I would like to think that I was a pretty good designer and product strategy person even before I started, you know, my own company, but I wasn't always even thinking about that. Right. And, and the thing of it is like as researchers and, and designers and product people, we can be showing impact even just by opening that conversation. Like, Hey, we're building this great thing, but we're going to do research to understand what minimum awesome is. And we're going to help understand the steps we need to usher for people to get them there. And by the way, we're going to design awesome, right? Cause like, that's the part that people focus on. We launched this great thing, but you know, a lot of stuff you've written about and spoken about is, well, if they don't know how to get to it and they don't know it exists and they don't know how to get awesome out of it, it doesn't actually matter how great it is. Yeah. And that's, that's, I think, in my head, driven by, it's always been driven by wanting to grow revenue, right? And that's where having the complete view of a of a company helps because I knew that what we were doing in the product and what we were building was absolutely crucial to the success of our company because it's a, it's a product company, right? It's all based on that SaaS app. But I, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> but I knew if we built it and no one knew about it, 
then it's not successful. And I knew that if people knew about it, but they didn't care or didn't use it, it meant we built the wrong thing. And so as you peel these onions back, if you do all those things right, you know, mm -hmm. you you build the feature and you've built the right feature and you let people know about it, well, that means they you retain them, their churn goes down, your revenue goes up. And to me, I was always looking at that view, right? It, it's the whole layer. It's four stacks of things on top of each other. It is harder if you work at a company and you don't get that visibility into it. You know, right. you don't understand or know, or you're not told, or you don't have access to the data to say, hey, this actually lowers churn, you know, or people say this is a great thing. And I'm not even saying you need some dashboard, you need to measure, you know, in a spreadsheet every single interaction and, and try to do, uh, you know, artificial intelligent machine learning predictions, or, or even retrospectives of like, well, this definitely in, you know, increased retention. I'm saying even just conversations with customers, because that's what we did in the early days when mm -hmm. we were moving a 1000 miles an hour, you know, I didn't have some big dashboard. I just knew when we launched something, we emailed people, we'd get replies, it was like, this is fantastic. I'm, I love this, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, this is really this is helpful. And then we over over time, we would see the, the churn go down. So um, I'm definitely not, you know, I mentioned to you, I'm not classically trained in, in any of this, but it's, it's kind of wound up being a necessity to build a company. And, you know, sometimes I think that I do think we can overcomplicate this, this process and, and these things and try to make them too just too intense where it's like, I'm going to take two weeks and I'm going to write code and I'm going to engineer and instrument and da, da 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 And it's like, maybe we could just do this in an hour with like a few emails, you know, is there a way to just simplify this and get a, get a 70 or 80% of the answer, but it's good enough to know that, yeah, that was the right choice. Yep, definitely. And the tip I would share with those listening who are not working in, you know, a smaller, faster moving company, like you described is when you have a new project kicking off or going to kick off, ask these questions. Hey, what is this project meant to help with? Is it, is it meant to help activation? Because any larger company ought to have a good business case. Any successful company ought to have a business case for that, right? And they're trying to solve, uh, I, I think what you were alluding to is like one of a handful of things. They're trying to get more customers. They're trying to grow the customers they have, or they're trying to save them from leaving. Like that's kind of the life cycle, right? You can get on to the nuance of it. But as a designer, a researcher, a product team, if you're the one that starts that conversation, that even in and of itself is super helpful. But then what it does, it allows you to provide value through the work that you do. As a researcher, hey, guess what? I can craft a study, you know, uh, even a lightweight one really quickly to get us some answers on how we help activate people or how we help save people from canceling or et cetera. Right. And if people know that you're going to ask that question every time, then they will start anticipating that. And it will make the whole org better because everyone will be thinking, what is the purpose of this thing we're about to build even before you ask it, you know, and, and obviously you ask it with tact and you ask it nicely and you don't, right. you know, call people out if they're not doing it. But if you, you ask that five times over the course of five weeks, about five features that someone's suggesting mm -hmm. that you're going to build, everyone will just start expecting you're going to ask it. And that's, that's a good thing. It, it improves everybody. Right. Because that means they have to start asking it of themselves, if nothing else. Love it. I love it. So Rob, we, uh, we're coming up towards the end of our time here, and I want to be respectful of that for you. I, one of the things I ask usually on our podcast is, uh, you know, what's some, uh, I got hit on the head. I have temporary amnesia. For you, what do you think is one main point that people should take away if they remember nothing else of our conversation? What do you think is that one most important salient point? I feel like it's something I said really early on about, you know, deciding what to build and how to build it, I think should be this combination of customer inputs and this instinct, gut feeling, vision that you develop over time, oftentimes through customer inputs, sometimes through your own experience, and sometimes through market research, you know, that kind of informs your own vision. Mm -hmm. Merging that with customer customer inputs over time, I think is... Um, the best way to, to build products, the best way to build opinionated products. I love it. It's damn good advice. And uh, it's advice we follow. So Rob, I'm quite sure we can talk about this for a whole nother hour or more, but we do have to wrap it up. And uh, just in spite of that, before we do, is there anything that you want to share with folks that we didn't cover or touch on in today's episode? You know, I think if, if, what I've said is interesting. I talk about 
this and other startup and SaaS related topics for about 30 minutes every Tuesday morning. It's on a podcast called Startups for the Rest of Us. And we've been going for eight years since 2010 every week. And um, I think that that's, that'd probably be the, the thing I'd ask folks to do if they are interested in hearing more from me. Awesome. We're going to make sure that we have links to that in the show notes. And uh, we'll be linking out to you know Rob's Twitter and other websites. So if folks want to follow you and potentially you know reach out and continue this conversation, they'll be able to do that. Uh, but that's going to be it for now. Rob, thank you so much for taking your time and sharing the insights that you have and stories of very real applied experience in this world. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. All right, everybody. We will see you next time. If you enjoyed this episode, consider leaving us a rating on iTunes or wherever it is that you listen to our podcast. And also, you can fill out our podcast survey where you can let us know if someone awesome that we should have on the show and even tell us about the things you would want to hear about, topics that are interesting for you. You can check that out in the show notes or on our website. Thanks for listening to the Aurelius Podcast, the show where we talk with brilliant minds about user research, UX design, and building great products that meet the needs of real people and what you learned about them. Aurelius is a user research and insights tool for design and product teams. Aurelius helps you add, tag, organize, search, and share all of your user research notes and customer feedback insights to figure out what you learned faster and easier than ever before so you can make awesome designs, products, and features. Check us out for a free trial at AureliusLab.com. That is A-U-R-E-L-I-U-S-L-A-B.com. Or find us on Twitter at AureliusLab. We'll see you next time.